Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. Yo, what is up, guys? Welcome back to First Cut. This is our spoiler review of X-Men 97. We're going to be talking about, obviously, the finale, but we're going to be talking about the season as a whole as well. I'm here with RB3. RB3, how you feeling, man? Feeling good, man. This is a great series, and I'm glad to see Marvel back on top. Yeah, I'm excited to get into it. The first thing I want to do, RB3, is talk about your experience with X-Men. The property, the media, the comics, the show, whatever your first experience with X-Men was, I just want to get a brief little uh, background as far as your uh, information on X-Men. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my first X-Men movie in theaters was X2, uh, X-Men United, which is, I would honestly argue, the second best X-Men movie ever made. I'm actually, uh, I'm probably thinking about doing some sort of video about like ranking some of these movies. I don't know. You know what I mean? Uh, but I have re been rewatching all the X-Men movies leading up to, to Deadpool 3 as as well as uh, I've, nev I've never seen X-Men 97 though. So I've never actually seen or the original X-Men. I've actually never seen the original X-Men animated series. Uh, but I have seen all the movies and the movies truly are some are good. Some are OK. Some are misses. But they don't really get to the spirit of the X-Men that you feel radiating off the screen when you watch X-Men 97. And again, this is from somebody who didn't watch the animated show at all, the, the 90s version of it. So this is almost like a completely new story for me, pretty much. And even just picking up from where it's kicking off on, it's dynamic storytelling, um, great characterization across the board from all the characters. And it's a beautiful mixture of tragedy comedy and also to some level existentialism as well uh so i thought it was a, a, a great series i think it's probably one of the better animated superhero series we've seen in a long time and in terms of x-men adaptations it definitely is probably one of the best x-men adaptations of all time I, I don't again i i say that with saying you know I, I love logan and i love x2 and i i do love the days of future past movie a lot too but you know in terms of like adapting as many storylines as this series has done as X-Men 97 has done. And I'm only going off of that. I'm not X-Men really like reader. I never really read a lot of these comics, but just listening to breakdowns and understanding how many different storylines that kind of interweaved into one season, this is a brilliant adaptation for show for show. Yeah, it's insane. I, I want to do a brief one on mine. Obviously, I grew up with the original animated series. I was very, very young, though, so I definitely don't remember everything. Uh, so it definitely took a rewatch for me to refresh my memory on a few uh, storylines and stuff like that. But I grew up with the series, so I clearly remember Gambit, Magneto, Wolverine, and the height of this excitement around these characters and around that time period. Because, again, the 90s was a crazy time period where comic book adaptations of animated properties right this was the time x-men kind of started that but there was also batman the animated series spider-man the animated series which transferred into the dc stuff that i fell in love with which was obviously superman the animated series and justice league which led me to my dc love as well so this was a lot of introduction for a lot of millennial kids who were first meeting the x-men for the first time and learning about the comics so from there i got into a little bit of the comics and obviously the movies that you said as well, which I fell in love with, especially, like you said, X2 and First Class, which are my favorites. But I feel like this might be one of the best X-Men adaptations, if not the best X-Men adaptation ever. I'm absolutely smitten by what I've just seen on screen. And I'm so excited to get into it, RB3. Let's not wait any longer. Let's get into that finale. RB3, what are your thoughts on the finale of X-Men 97? Uh, finale was great. You know what I mean? The finale was uh, really strong and it pretty perfectly tied up a lot of the storylines that we were establishing, especially with Bastion and with Mr. Sinister. Um, I love seeing Mr. Sinister have finally uh, have his comeuppance, you know what I mean? Turn into that old man. And then he stumbles up to Morph, like, show me my face. And then Morph, like, half smiles and then transforms into the old man. I thought that was that was nice. And, uh, I mean, speaking of the whole uh, tolerance is extinction, sto tolerance is extinction storyline, all three episodes leading up to the finale, I thought it was all 
really brilliant storytelling. I mean, going in from Professor X return to to Earth after being on the planet with the bird people um, in episode eight to the war that Magneto and Professor X had, you know, lead it ultimately led to Magneto ripping out all the animantium out of Wolverine at the end of episode nine. And then, of course, this one ending with uh, Forge and Bishop kind of having that little bit of a standoff, uh, you know, like, well, like for one, like, where was Bishop at this whole time, right? Uh, that's why everybody keeps asking. It's like, yeah, he was the coolest character in, like, the first episode, and he didn't show up. But I know they're going to explain it all, and they're kind of teasing, you know, the other X-Men are in other timelines. Um, a lot of the crew are going to be interacting with the original Apocalypse, you know what I mean? And the, that BC era, 3000 BC or whatever. And then some people are going to be in the future. I'm, I'm just very curious to see where s- season two goes. But shout out, you know what I mean? I don't know if it's going to be controversial to say this down the line. But shout out Bo, Bo DeMeo. You know what I mean? Shout out Bo DeMeo for, for making this show, man. You know what I mean? I know he's one of the many creators and writers on the show. And then also shout out to the animators, too, because the animators are really pushed it to the next level. But gosh, dog. You know what I mean? These storylines were phenomenal. The, the structuring was great. The characterization was great. It seemed like it was from somebody who, like, really honestly thought thought out the mythology through and through and was just ready to load fans up while also giving the perfect amount of fan service, like not too much, not too little, um, maybe a little bit more in the finale. That was like, yo, we cut to like pretty much every hero. You know, we see like Iron Man, Captain America, Gosh Dog, Doctor Strange, you know? So it was, we did see a lot of like fan service in the finale, but I thought it was, it was earned for sure. Yeah. Those cameos were crazy, man. Daredevil is the one that got me. Daredevil. Uh, yeah. But we see, and we see Black Panther. We see uh, T'Chaka. T'Chaka is Black Panther. Mm-hmm. Um, I made sure to take a note of it that it's not T'Challa, but T'Chaka. Um, but mm-hmm. we see all these cameos that obviously brought back a lot of memories for Marvel fans and that kind of established this time period as far as where Marvel's at in this time. Uh, I also think it's funny, just as a side note, how Captain America's like, sir, we must do this. And he's like, no, we're going to blow it up. We're just going to nuke the asteroid. And he's like... Damn, all right, sir. I'm just like, bro, this <laughs> Captain America sucks. <laughs> um, well, we saw but yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I was going to say, we saw Captain America kind of sucking before in the season when he was trying yeah. to get in Rogue's way and then Rogue and him yeah. have to throw the, the, the shield to the other side of the mountain. Yeah, so. she calls him America's top cop. And yeah. I was like, low key. Low key, man, or high key. Right. Um, but I feel like that the finale had so much man i, I want to get to all of it let's get to phoenix how did you feel seeing the phoenix force come out of gene gray in that one scene yeah that was cool it was cool seeing it um embraced in a positive light instead of the traditional antagonistic light that we have always seen it in again it just further propels the central theme of embracing your inner power embracing your inner mutant same thing we saw with storm uh, confront when she had to speak to the owl demon thingy, you know, back in uh, episode five, I think it was, uh, Life After Death. And we obviously saw with Sunspot as well throughout the series, him and Jubilee struggle. Well, Jubilee trying to convince Sunspot, hey, you got to come out your shell, you got to accept who you are. And ultimately, he ultimately he does and is and is beneficial to the team. So yeah, I thought it was just another example of like nailing the team aspect of the X-Men while also nailing the individual growth that each character is experiencing throughout the season. Yeah, and then from there, we jump to Bastion transforming and fighting the entire X-Men. What was the highlight of this Bastion fight that stood out to you? Because it was pretty much like 10, 15 minutes of the entire episode, if not a little more. Yeah. Um, So what stood out to you when Bastion was just going ham against everyone? I mean, it's everything Nightcrawler. I mean, for one, Nightcrawler, the way that we see Nightcrawler's power so trade cool. in this episode, in this whole series has been phenomenal. Uh, again, going back to episode eight, when the X-Mansion was raided and Wolverine and Nightcrawler were trying to protect Jean Grey. And then you see there's like rogue. a rogue, rogue one. Yeah, you're right, rogue. And there's that one shot, Wolverine like stabs a homie at the same time that Nightcrawler is teleporting him. And then you just see like the shot from inside of Nightcrawler's perspective. I'm like, whoa, man, they killing it. And then, yeah, there's that one sequence in this one where Nightcrawler is just like teleporting all around Bastion, like punching him. And then Bastion's like, "Hmm, wait, is there a pattern to this? And then catches him. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. Like they're going crazy with it. Uh, So that, that moment was phenomenal, too. 
Yeah, I love that one. I loved Rogue uh, having a moment to go off a little bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, show off her, her power. Mm. I thought that was really cool. Um, I love the rest of the team coming in to try and stop them. Mm. I thought that was a, a really cool way to, to do this team up type thing. What did you think of Cyclops kind of stopping this fight and being like, yo, let's let's do the the talking. Let's just talk this shit out. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's very it's a very leader thing of him to do. I mean again, it's like I again they they get the all the character right arcs completely right because it's like in the beginning of the season, he was like a more questionable leader. He was undoubtedly the leader, but he was kind of questioning his ways, questioning his ways raising or not raising, I should say, Nate, you know, Cable, uh, and how he's just living his life as a leader of the X-Men. But now he kind of fully embraces and he finally embraces Charles's message of, like, peace and unity in, in a way. And it, even to the point where Bastion's like, yo, I just mur- I just massacred all of y'all and you're trying to recruit me? Like, that's crazy. And it does seem crazy, but, you know, it makes sense. Yeah, I, I loved it. I thought it was really interesting. I can't lie. I, they were building that moment up. Mm. like a good 15 seconds with the music yeah. and it just kept zooming in on cyclops like the mm. slow like drawn into his face and i was like he's gonna say some wild some crazy because cyclops is like he he'll throw hands man like he will f stuff up mm-hmm. um when he needs to so i i thought for sure he was gonna be like you know take his head or something crazy he was gonna say mm. uh but instead he he's decided to stand down which i thought was very interesting and in a way if you think about it president kelly kind of cost <laughs> yeah this cataclysmic event bro president kelly bro i swear th- this is another one that he's in five scenes maybe or less mm-hmm. and yet his characterization is so perfectly fit into the story mm-hmm. about being a centrist and mm-hmm. how it's basically the same thing as being <laughs> an idiot. It's like this kind of down the line type mentality leads to human extinction and and and, and mutant extinction too. Just this ridiculous uh, ideology that he has, and that's a very American ideology of pretending to do the right thing and claiming it's the right thing when in reality it's going to lead to a cataclysmic event. I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of commentary there, even though if it's just five scenes where he's just like, oh, crap, well, let's, let's just nuke the asteroid. Let's just mm-hmm. do that. Yeah. Idiot, bro. Well, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's him. Yeah, go it's, ahead. it's him. It's Cooper. You know what I mean? It's home, homegirl. Cooper, yeah. Yeah, Val, I think Valerie Cooper or something like that. Um, yeah. It's just people like that who just think they could play both sides and want to, you know, uh, game for their political aspirations. But we never – but when they when it's time to be held accountable – you know, it's like the account, the accountability is on other people. It's not on themselves. And then Cooper actually finally accepts like the fact that she was wrong and actually like turns and, and, and tries to help Mac and helps Magneto escape. But by that point, it's, it's already too late. The pain's already been dealt. Genosha's already been, you know what I mean? Which is one of the most heartbreaking yeah. Marvel moments, I think in the MCU period, you know what I mean? So it was, it was, yeah. they had some impactful stuff all the way around. Even, and it, it was even called back, I think, in episode nine or episode eight or episode nine. It's like so many heartbreaking moments happen in that episode. It's like you can't live that back. And I'm glad the show didn't really try to cop it out with time travel or time loops or anything like that yet. I feel like they're going to get to that in season two. But I'm glad that at least season one so far is pretty much like what happened, happened. Like, let's keep it pushing, you know? Yeah, me too. I, I, I really like that they didn't just undo it right away. Uh which would have been fine, but it, it wouldn't have had as, as strong of an impact as it did, especially with Leech, because I feel like Leech, uh, Leech, which was that little kid, mm. yeah, really, just the sting of it, right? That the pain of it still lingers in Magneto and still lingers inside the entire motivation of who his character is. Uh, which brings me to my next point in my notes, which is Magneto. Uh, bro, I told you a couple weeks back, but I've loved this character for my entire life uh i have i actually have in my closet like right in front of me my magneto was right shirt i think you've seen me wear that Mm -hmm. uh a few times i don't Mm -hmm. know i think i've worn it i wore it at comic con Mm -hmm. uh when you were there but i've loved this character for years and this is one of my favorite adaptations of that character and the way he ended his arc here even though it kind of like undoes what undoes or undones He's reversing what he did, but still, mm-hmm. I felt like it worked within that character arc, and it worked with that moment with him and Charles having that hash out, hashing out moment inside his brain. 
what did you feel about Magneto in the season finale, but also Magneto as a whole? Yeah, Magneto as a whole has always been a, a great character um, altogether. I feel like that was honestly the strongest part of the prequel. Not prequel, I guess kind of prequel. The Michael Fassbender yeah, version. First class. And, yeah. yeah, first class. Definitely first class. If I'm being honest, I rewatched first class and uh, I used to really, really love that movie, but some parts of it are just like not watchable for me like now, you know what I mean? In this, in this era. But that being said though, the Magneto parts of it are exhilarating and that's because... Whether you're talking about Ian McKellen, Michael Fassbender, or the voice actor who one. plays uh, this yeah. ver- this version, they all bring this a certain Magneto. level of intensity, of intellectualism, of philosophy that it's kind of really hard to argue their logic. You know what I mean? It's kind of really hard to see any other point besides their perspective. I think where the X Men the X Men movies fail is that they have to pre- present him as an all out bad guy. So then in the sense of the movies, especially in X-Men The Last Stand, he really doesn't have a logical villain arc. Like, he's almost kind of, it it, it really doesn't even match the Magneto that we saw in the first two X-Men movies, honestly. So, they didn't really get, they didn't really stick the landing with that. With the prequel series, they definitely stick the landing with the Michael Fassbender stuff. But with this one, this was, even goes harder because he's, we see the pain that he's enduring both, as a child, like they kind of briefly allude to the stuff that happened, you know, with the Holocaust and stuff like that in this season. They didn't, I guess they couldn't really do that in the original anime series. They allude to it a little bit more in this series, but more importantly, again, like we mentioned, Genosha, we see that happen from his perspective. And that's almost like a second Holocaust in a way, you know? So it's like, he almost got double the amount of pain. Like he saw two genocides in his lifetime and you see how that resonates with him and affects him and just breaks his, his psyche. Um, to the point where, like, yeah, when he is shutting down the power across the world, I'm like, yeah, let's let's have a couple blackouts. Why not? Like, we kind of deserve it at this point <laughs> in the context of the show. Yeah, I, I felt like, I just felt like it was a phenomenal character arc, a phenomenal character journey, and just a phenomenal character in, in, in general. One of my favorite all time, if I'm being honest, characters. And I feel like this adaptation is one of the best I've ever seen. Now, this finale ends with the tease for next season. We see the time travel aspect of the X-Men where uh, Scott and Jean are sent to the far off future where they see mm-hmm. a young Nathan. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of the team is sent to 3000 BC where they meet a young Apocalypse mm-hmm. or En Sabanor is his actual name. So they're teasing what's coming up for next season. Uh, regardless what comes from next season, I really do feel like this season as a whole is probably my favorite marvel show and and if i'm being honest rb3 you know what's crazy man the more i think about it the more i'm like this this is the type of adaptation that i've been asking for for a minute when it comes to the x-men we've talked about x-men adaptations in the past on this channel but what do you feel like this show is trying to show the mcu what is the key to an x-men adaptation to a good x-men adaptation I mean, the key to me, the key to a good X Men adaptation is not run from the the racial themes, not run from the uh, underlying currents that are in it. Because if I'm being honest, and we talked about this in the meaning of episode talking about the X Men series, the Brian Singer series did not in any way make it about race. Like you know, when people say that the X Men were, were originally created because of Malcolm X versus Martin Luther King. I never bought it throughout my entire life. I never bought that because they never addressed that in the movies, in the movies. Now, again, I never watched the anime show. I never read the comics, but in the movies, they make it a completely different thing. I would almost argue it's more analogous to the, to the Jewish struggle. You know what I mean? With, uh, with, uh, hiding your own identity, even though you live in the same skin as, you know, the privilege and and things like that. So I thought I was like, yeah, they kind of made that analogous, but this with it if they what this show what 97 showed is that you can make a much more clearer a much more pointed racial analogy towards them i mean heck from the very first episode of 97 they play x you know professor x's absence like his missing as if it was an assassination like a martin luther king just got assassinated what does the post world post civil rights world start to look like and that's movies that we've seen that explored in movies like um, uptight, this 1968 movie that took place immediately after MLK's assassination. And a lot of 
sixties and seventies movies, black exploitation movies were directly addressing that in that sense. Uh, but this movie actually took it. This series, I should say, took it serious, and I think they should take that into a movie adaptation. That's why I'm kind of glad I'm hearing rumors about you know Ryan Kluger potentially being uh, tapped to do an X Men movie. I'll be hyped for that because I think he understands, like, yeah, it's, you could get, you know, for lack of a better term, get woke. You know, you won't, if you if you go woke, you're not going to go broke. You're actually going <laughs> to make a lot of money and, and, and tell a poignant story that people are going to connect to. So go woke with it, y'all. Just go woke with it. Go woke with X-Men. I feel like that's exactly it. It's the themes of of X-Men have always been about this, right? And like you said, maybe the Brian Singer movies didn't do that. But the fact is, this is what the essence of the best arcs of the X-Men have ever been. It's always been about inequality. It's always been about social justice. That's what it's always been about. And mm-hmm. that's why leaning away from those themes, which I, I, I know you just said that Ryan Kluger might be attached to it, but like, is my fear of what the MCU can possibly do or do like mm-hmm. a centrist kind of like, well, if we just hold hands and just agree to disagree, like, I don't want to do that. I, I want to see what what is that visceral feeling of being personally persecuted against. The, the, the episode, like you said, this first season starts out with Friends of Humanity. Like, we see basically like a, a hate group attacking the X-Men. Mm-hmm. That's the first villain, not this super powerful evil mutant who's using his powers. No, it's it's... Humanity. It's a racist hate group. Yeah, Sentinels too. Wants to, yeah, and Sentinels mm. are the perfect example, right? Because they're just built on discriminating against um, mutants. And they're basically just giant robot cops uh, hunting down mutants. So leaning away from those themes are what make a bad adaptation. Leaning into those themes are really what are at the core of the X-Men. And I feel like that's what made the show so good. And also the characters combining those two right focusing on how each character reacts to that but also still meeting and being a team right where cyclops can differ from storm or gene can differ from logan but at the same time they're still together and the same thing with magneto magneto and the x-men where as stark difference as they are they still have that connection of being a mutant and having that together so I, I, I hope we see these type of themes inside a film. I feel like that would be a, a key. Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like that would be the goal. I know you're kind of like, you know, and I, I think that's why Ryan Coogler, listen, you know, I know Ryan Coogler. I know Black Panther's not the most leftist movie. I know it kind of aims down the middle. But to be honest, that's the most radical a Marvel movie's ever going to get. So, <laughs> and they're never going to go that radical again, I don't think. So I hope they keep, uh, I hope, you know, if, like, if, if they do get a voice in it, give somebody with the clout or the power to, like, flex their muscles like Ryan Coogler and be like, yo, we keeping all the, d- the deep stuff in here. We're not cutting away from that, you know? So I hope they, I hope they, they see that in the, in the film, whoever filmmaker they end up choosing. If it is Coogler, I just hope it's not, like, one of those, you know, push around kind of directors like I don't want to. I don't want to be Big too Watson, much of a hater. I don't want to be too much of a hater, but I don't want it to be a John Watt situation where it's like they just oh, hand them, you know, the script and just like push them along and just, you know, oh, we already we already shot the movie. You just gotta point the camera in and direct the actors a little bit. Uh, I just hope it's not yeah. one of that kind of situations. You know what I mean? So. And the worst, the worst part is that Marvel is low key kind of going downhill, and it makes me more trepidatious um, that they're going to do a good adaptation because I feel like I still think they're going to shy away from it. There's a really good video on YouTube if anyone wants to check it out. I forget the channel, but it's called MCU Status Quo, and they do a really good explanation as far as uh, how the MCU is just the most down the middle status quo type of uh, filmography. And, and it's kind of frustrating because I've seen it happen so many times and I've talked to you about it quite a bit that I feel like Kevin Feige is like, all right, who cares? It's animated. Let them do what they want in animation. But when it comes to live action, that's my baby. I'm going to make sure that that thing is <laughs> right down the middle. <laughs> um, so that's that's my biggest fear. But obviously, we're looking way towards the future. I want to look at the now 
which is this show right here. RB3, what do you think is the standout episode or the best episode of this season of X-Men 97? Um, I mean, I definitely think it was the... Uh... I mean, I, I listen, it's obvious, you know, it was the midpoint climax, you know, it was episode five, the yeah. Genosha Remember it? massacre. Yeah, yeah. That was obviously very, very impactful. Um, but then that being said, though, I know it's like the obvious choice. And I do want to shout out Life After Death Part 2, you know what I mean, where we see Storm recovering, get her power. She, get, she gets her little Superman fly on. That's phenomenal. And uh, also, again, sh- shout out the episode with Jubilee. I think it was also... Life Death Part One, and it was another time I forgot the the other part of it. But with Jubilee yeah. and following Sunspot, and and those characters just having like a little moment to themselves, I thought that was phenomenal too. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree. Obviously, it's hard to top. Um, remember it. I feel like that's definitely that's the episode that they're really highlighting as well. So I really think it's hard to top that. Um, but yeah, when it comes to standout characters, RB three, who do you feel like really stood out this season? Shout out my man Gambit. You know what I mean? Gambit really, yeah. really came in heavy. And and again, I've never really seen too many Gambit adaptations outside of Taylor Kitsch and X Men Wolverine. Uh, which he wasn't he wasn't that bad. Honestly, you go back and rewatch it, he actually wasn't that bad of a Gambit. The character was not used very very effectively, uh, but his performance was okay. I would have still loved to have seen a Channing Tatum version of it. And I, you know, would after seeing X Men ninety seven, I would like to go back and rewatch, you know, the nineties X Men and see how how his character was there. But he was firing this, man. Every line he was spitting, every bar, every character was spitting was just too fire. Like we gotta talk about best lines, you know what I mean? Oh uh, man. Mind your Let's weather. Do it. Let's do it right now. Yeah, come on. Mind your weather, weather your mind. Like, come on, yeah. man. Like or oh, then what did uh there's so many. There's too many bars. There's too many bars. I gotta think of G- Give me give me some. Do you have some? Uh the whole speech that Nightcrawler gave at uh uh-uh. Gambit's funeral. You know what yeah. I mean? Like uh he said something about uh a gambler's life will always follow you, but he just said he said it's such classic. I can't even. I don't even want to misquote it. You know what I mean? But uh, a lot of bars, a lot of bars. What about you though? Yeah, I, I, I want to echo the Gambit segment too. Gambit, man, Gambit was my favorite character as a kid. Like, just the the character design is really cool. The glowing red eyes, the power. I think that's one of the coolest powers ever. Mm. Just making kinetic bombs out of any object you touch. That's like the coolest thing. I could think of as a kid and then his bow staff i love bow staffs like tim drake is my favorite robin mm. um donatello is my favorite ninja turtle like i'm obsessed with bow staffs <laughs> uh and the fact that he had a bow staff and he was really good at it was also really cool that i've always loved so seeing gambit re- resurrected gambit to me like he's a gangster bro like he's legit like a french gangster <laughs> uh part of the thieves guild uh his backstory is really cool and really interesting and he's like one of those characters that shows Professor X's, because we always think of Logan as like the rebel, the angry dude, but but Gambit is really that dude, and he's like also like swaggy and cool mm-hmm. and different. Whereas Logan is just like in the animated version at least is very angry and bitter. Where Gambit tries to see a little bit more positive, even though his backstory is also pretty tragic and different. Mm-hmm. So shout out to Gambit. I love that character. I will always love that character. Uh, favorite lines? There's so many, bro. Uh, everything Magneto said. <laughs> Yeah. Magneto's a philosopher, a scholar, uh, a legend. Man, it, they shall be avenged when he pulls out the train. They shall be avenged. And the train just comes out. Ooh. Mm. That was sick. Uh, we will not live our lives wondering if we could have saved more. Um, yeah. Is another beautiful line that I really love. Um, gods abandon those who believe in them, but mutants do not. I love that because it shows that solidarity and that power. Mm. Um, what else did he say? Uh, there's so much. I got a, I got another one this time okay. from Scott, from Scott, uh, oh. Summers, uh, when he was like, uh, uh, well, he had a couple, but the one when he told Storm, like, uh, unleash the, unleash the storm or something like that. What do you say? Unleash the rain? Or he said something that was like, unleash something that like really kicked it off. That was fire. Um, Dang, he had another one that was just, I literally oh, just Oh, I had tweeted it. one out that Scott said, but it, it's only good in, in theory and in, in, uh, in context, I mean. Uh-huh. When he said, if Genosha looked more human, you would be more worried about lives uh, 
than the life lost than than the polls something oh, like yeah. that when he was yeah. talking to the president yeah um and then uh for me that was really good yeah that was that was super fire i definitely remember that one and then logan logan this one was like more of a cute funny line but then after gene I, it, it was either gene gray or madeline Pryor. one of them kissed logan and then, uh, and then, and then Logan like kind of blushes a little bit. He's like, "You're Jean Gay, yeah, you're you're Jean Grey. He's got Summers. Those are the rules." And then he just walks away. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's so that's very that's very funny, man. Uh, it, they had some, yeah. That was it was all it was all, it was all bars. bars. Yeah, it was all bars. That, that's, yeah, that's the other man. thing. Make X Men like poetic again. Yeah, like g- let him be scholarly poets because everyone in this show man except for maybe logan mm-hmm. was like a poet like yeah. dead ass like professor x said crazy shit uh scott said some wild stuff gene nightcrawler. storm nightcrawler was built different when it mm-hmm. comes to just making speeches um make let him do that and, and i want to give a shout out because i also mentioned standout characters you mentioned gambit scott summers man scott freaking summers bro yeah. this dude people have been spitting on his name have been disrespecting him, bro. They've been making mm-hmm. diss tracks about him for years. He finally made his uh his Kendrick Lamar return. Uh, He's not like us, bro. He's built different. Yeah. Uh Scott Summers is one of my favorite characters for years. And he's amazing in the comics. And now they I feel like they finally gave us a good adaptation version of his character that's um visual media and not just comic media. Mm-hmm. But he's 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 like a, a semi he's like a grade below magneto he's like that kind of dude where he's mm-hmm. just like headstrong focused determined locked in he doesn't care uh he just really wants to liberate his people mm-hmm. and and i felt like this was such a good adaptation of scott it, it's one of my favorites if not my favorite adaptation ever of scott yeah Sanders. and then it, it, it's definitely my favorite and especially is a lot better than of course, what we saw and oh, the, movies. Uh, the movies. And again, it's another reason why X-Men The Last Stand is like, I, I get why people don't like it. Because as a kid, I actually liked X-Men The Last Stand. Like, I actually thought it was good. I thought like, you know, it's the same thing of like Spider-Man 3. I just had nostalgia for it. And I always had it. But then re-watching it after watching X-Men 97 or after starting X-Men 97, it's like, whoa, they really messed up. Like, hey, they killed Scott Summers off. He didn't really, he didn't really even really get a standout moment in the first two movies. And then they kill him off in the third one. It's like, come on. They did Magneto wrong. They sidelined the Phoenix storyline with G. Gray. Like, it was like everything that could have gone wrong with that movie did go wrong. And it's like, dang. But now just now that now that I know what a good X-Men characters look like and what good x-men a good x-men adaptation looks like now the the bar is way higher now it's, honestly it's gonna be harder for marvel to make a live action movie that i'm gonna feel like is gonna compete with with uh with this show and i don't know if they kind of shot themselves in the foot with that but then again I, hey listen you get a screenplay by bo de uh joe robert cole and ryan coogler an x-men movie that is just pure bars pure heady philosophical dialogue and discussion and you know with some good action but mostly about the themes then you got me you got me because we haven't seen that yet it's all been they've all been action movies to this point and if we get to a real thematic kind of movie with 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 the x-men i I would watch that in a heartbeat for sure for sure yeah me too man and let's hope we get that because obviously i feel like marvel needs a, a hit on their hands and they also need a a change up in their formula because I feel like the formula is becoming so predictable now that a 10 year old could tell you uh, what's going to happen inside a Marvel movie. So mm-hmm. any final thoughts on X-Men 97 RB3? Nah, man, other than shout out animation, shout out, uh, animation. you know, animated superhero movies or, 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 or TV, TV shows or content in general, you know, compared to, I love invincible, you know what I mean? Invincible's fire, but this is like a whole, whole nother level. And uh, didn't it, Marvel put out another animated thing? Oh, of course, What If. What If is cool, too. Oh, if, yeah. But again, this is elevating the, the art form. I do hope they just keep, you know, pushing these storylines forward. And I know they got rid of Bo DeMeo for whatever he did. I don't know what he did. But, I don't know what ho- he did either. yeah, I mean, hey, uh, hopefully season two is just the same quality as season one. Because to my understanding, they fired him during the writing of season three. So I'm at least looking at season two like, this better be right up there that same quality level uh but also again the animators i can't i can't not shout out the animators because the animation in this show is 
also wicked. Like, there are times when they're it's stuttery and kind of look very 90s, and there are other times where it just looks completely ambitious and vibrant and surreal in some ways, especially when uh, Professor X w- uh, was inside of Magneto's mind, inside of that classroom, and the water kept... I don't know if it was a classroom or what setting that was, but it was, like, in the middle of the ocean. Like, it was just deep. It was deep with the rain outside. Deep stuff. I, I didn't talk about that scene. I have to. I have to. I know we're finishing up. That's my fa- That was my favorite scene in, in the finale, man. It broke me. It got me. It, it was so emotional, the way he described the cold water, mm-hmm. the way he said, I can remember my family, and we see the ship, and we see Pietro, yeah. and, uh, and Wanda, and then Polaris. Mm-hmm. Um it just and then the whole like Eric, you're you're my friend. You're we're together. We're family. We got this. You are Eric Magnus Lencher, mm-hmm. but you're also known by another name. And then the music starts building up, and I was like, bro, yeah. stop! You're gonna make me cry, bro. Yeah. Uh, I love that scene. That was definitely an incredible scene, and the animation was beautiful, as you said. Shout out to the animators. Um, yeah, I'll let you finish. Sorry. No, that was it. That's all I had to say. Fire stuff. Uh, the one thing I want to say, kind of echoing your animation uh, compliment, is animation is cinema. And I really do feel and I hope people watch this as X-Men and not as animated X-Men. You know what I'm saying? Where we can say this is quality storytelling, period. Not this is quality animated storytelling. Where we can say this is good voice acting. No, this is good acting. Like that's the type of... Rapport, and that's the type of respect that we start that we need to start to have when it comes to animated medium and when it comes to animated shows and property where we can say this is an X Men adaptation and not like this is an animated X Men adaptation. Where I really do feel like we need to elevate this medium because the more we do, the more we elevate the creative team, like you said, the writers, the storytellers, um, to work on projects that maybe more people can watch. Um, and that's the only way to do it is to have that kind of respect. Um, so shout out to the entire creative team of X-Men 97. Shout out to good storytelling that can relate to our real world in a powerful, impactful way with characters that can impact, influence, inspire you in a very profound way that can, can keep you going in life and that can keep you motivated in a way that maybe our real life people and our real life heroes or real life people in power can't so shout out to x-men shout out to x-men 97 and i really do feel like this is one of the best uh, marvel projects ever yeah for sure for sure either way guys uh you can follow us at first cut tmo on social media follow us right here subscribe to first cut if you haven't done so already you can follow me at squad leader ace rb3 you can follow me on twitter and instagram at director rb3 Either way, guys, for the first crew, we're going to be peacing out. So peace, deuces. You